Would you like me to leave the light on for you? Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> I'm wearing two microphones tonight because my voice is pretty rocky. Um, I was just saying to somebody that I've struggled with pneumonia a couple of times this winter. And as a result, um, my voice has been left sounding like this. Now, my mother would have said I sound like June Allison. And I don't know if there's anybody here old enough to know the actress June Allison. But, but you know that sort of timbre that she had to her voice? This is apparently that kind of timber, if my mother would have said. Anyway, I'd love to think so. Um, tonight, I'm going to disappoint a couple of you, and hopefully not too many of you. Um, I have to admit to the fact that I have run into some problems um, as I was setting this thing up and putting it together. And the two problems that I've run into are unfortunately going to um, <laughs> affect Stephanie Boyd and Nancy Lynch, <laughs> just say. So um, bear with me and we'll hope that uh, everything will be well. <laughs> okay. I'm starting off right at the very, very beginning of um, what we might now called Gravenhurst, but what we certainly weren't calling Gravenhurst when a photograph like this might have been taken or a painting like this be made. Um, I can't even imagine what the women felt who first viewed the world into which they had walked and to which they had committed. Uh, hi, Robbie. I'm just going to let Robbie in. <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> Don't, it's okay. You're not even making a scene or anything. <laughs> I'm just welcoming you, you to a new world here, Robbie. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I walk through a set of woods that are fairly densely populated with trees, I sometimes pause and try to think about what it would have felt like if this had been 1859. And the trees would be extremely close together, quite large around, and would have been, um, I think, pretty daunting for most of us. Anyway, I just thought I would say that I am going to be looking at pioneer women, and I am going to be looking at how uh, those pioneer women coped with all of this before I move into the newer times. If my voice gives out, I'm just going to wave at you and point at pictures. <laughs> This is not a picture of the McCabe dwelling, but it will suffice for that. Uh, it was a two-story log cabin eventually, although when they began, uh, the McCabe dwelling was in fact um, just a little, um, what we call a shanty, I guess, basically. But they in fact gussied it up a bit and turned it into a log cabin like this. They called their little cabin in the woods the Freemason's Arms. Um, and in fact, James McCabe had taken out a, a land grant or a location ticket uh, for two places in this area, one of them being just south of, of our present um, uh, main part of our town, right opposite, if you like, the cemetery that is St. James Cemetery. So that's sort of roughly uh, where this house would have been. And he had a scow, which he parked on Lake Muskoka and called that as well McCabe's Landing. And it was a piece of land that he had um, dibs on. It didn't matter who turned up at the door, and there were a lot of people who did over the years. Um, they took them in. If somebody was needing a drink or a meal, that was fine. They fed them. If they needed a bed, they bedded them. And uh, I think it is a testimony to uh, the, um, what should we call it, hospitality, generosity of the McCabe's that this went on for a number of years. I can only think how welcoming that little light in the wilderness must have been. People walking through the bush seeing absolutely nothing until all of a sudden, off in the wilderness, there's a little tiny light and they think, oh my gosh, 
there is somebody out there. And that was Patricia McCabe or Mother McCabe as she was known. When places like shanties and log cabins were being built, it was all very well to have a man who could help and hired men, single men, uh, did drift about from time to time helping to build things. But when it came to something like sickness or delivering babies or all of the other kinds of things that intrude in real life, what on earth was a woman to do? Especially if it was her first baby and uh, she was going to be on her own. Well, she wasn't entirely on her own because in this particular case, she had someone named Jane Grimes, who actually was living in Southern Ontario um, after having emigrated from uh, the United States. She came to Gravenhurst um, in 1862 with her husband and seven children. Now, if you're looking for somebody who knows something about childbirth, I suspect <laughs> somebody who's given birth to seven kids probably has a pretty good idea. In actual fact, I started to say that she was the uh, um, the doctor of choice in the area. And then I thought, no, I can't really say that because Dr. Adams at the time was absolutely livid at the thought that she was there um, encroaching on his um, making a living and his world of medicine. But in fact, the women were looking for her, not for him. Um, if you were looking for somebody to help you to deliver a baby, why not go to a woman as opposed to a man who's never done it? Anyway, Jane was amazing. Uh, she was called out in the middle of the night. She was called out to go almost anywhere. And she usually went on her own because somebody stayed at home with the children that she had. Um, she was asked at one point, aren't you afraid of wolves <laughs> or bears? And she said, oh, no, no, I, I go my way, they go their way. And, and we all just sort of, you know, uh, let sleeping dogs lie, so to speak. Anyway, she seemed to be fearless and actually had very, very strong skills. She also was an extremely generous woman in another way. Um, she, along with her husband, Henry, um, contributed, but she particularly contributed to the building of the first, the second, and then the third Anglican church in Gravenhurst. The first Anglican church was a little log cabin down pretty much where um, James McCabe was because he had donated the land for it. Um, but then they needed a much bigger one. So they built a church in 18, roughly 1882, um, just about exactly where the one is now, except it burned down in the Great Fire. And so they had to build a third Anglican church. She raised money every time. She raised money for um, all kinds of things, including the first organ, but also the carpet that was going to go in the church. And apparently um, at a rather elderly age, she was busy laying the carpet. <laughs> and they said um, she went up and down the steps to the chancel just like a kid. <laughs> I don't know where her genes came from, but wherever they were, I wish I had them. Anyway, she, she has been, I think, rather a miracle worker in our early history. She was an example of a woman who was allowed to own land. Married women could, in fact, own land under an act that had been established in 1859. Interestingly enough, they could own it, but they couldn't do anything with it. <laughs> they had to ask their husbands before they could sell it <laughs> or even lease it to someone else and so on. But there's where Jane Bryan's land, and it's actually in her name. Now, they, they have different spellings for Bryan's all over the place. Um, I've seen it spelled B-R-Y that way, N-N-E-S and B-R-I-N-E-S, but in actual fact, the real spelling is B-R-I-N-E-S. I entitled this Mothers of Confederation. Always we hear about the Fathers of Confederation, but meanwhile, the women were very busy being pregnant. Um, they had far too many pregnancies for, you know, for, uh, for their own health and for the um, success of their families and so on. They were um, compelled to do endless physical labor. Here she is quite pregnant and is digging potatoes. Um, they wore cumbersome clothing, which was the rage at the time, of course, and they had second class citizenship. I love the statement in the election act that said, 
no woman, idiot, lunatic, or child shall vote. I mean, it gives you kind of an idea of where we were classified. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you know, hesitate to think. Anyway, in 1876, even, which is, you know, we're talking about substantially passage of time here, women were deemed to be persons with regard to pains and penalties under the law, but not with regard to rights and privileges. Sometimes you're a person and sometimes you're not. <laughs> I suspect she felt a lot less like a person when she was doing what she's doing there. Another pioneering woman um, that is worth more than a mention is Mary Brock. Mary Brock um, was the sister of Joseph Brock, who was one of the very first settlers in Graven. That's just after James McCabe. Joseph Brock had come from Thamesford, which is down in the sort of London region. Um, and uh, he had come, I think I probably talked to many of you uh, when I was talking about original settlers. He walked from Thamesford to Gravenhurst, built a little sort of a shanty um, to establish this is my land, walked back to Thamesford again. Now we're talking Thamesford. Picture how far Thamesford is from here. If anybody has an idea, if they, you know, I come sort of from that area of Ontario and <laughs> that's one heck of a walk. Anyway, he walked back, helped his father with the uh, chores and things for the winter, walked back again in the spring. This time came with a little, a little cart that he'd made, pulled by two oxen that he had raised, and pulling behind the little cart, a cow. Uh, and he established a log cabin, pretty much where the Baptist church is now. And uh, uh, he settled in there. His sister, not to be outdone, a year later, age 18, says, gee, I think I'm going to go and visit Joseph. <laughs> so she lives in Thamesford, and she decides to travel by herself all the way from Thamesford to Gravenhurst. She takes a train, and then a second train, and finally um, disembarks the train at Bell Ewart, which is basically the station for Barrie at the time. And then she gets onto a steamer and goes across Lake Simcoe. And then she gets off and gets onto another steamer and goes across Lake Puticheng. And then she gets off and now she's in Meshago. And at this point, her choice is walk the colonization road from Meshago to Gravenhurst. Now, when I say colonization road, you're probably picturing a road of some kind. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, this would be more like a trail. So think of it as being a, a trail through the bush. Um, there were, in fact, stagecoaches not long after journey up that well, colonization I mean, road. Uh, James Harvey had, uh, or John Harvey had uh, a raft of stagecoaches, but they spent most of their time digging themselves out of uh, places where logs had come up. Tough days back then. sunk oh. and so on. So that sometimes the journey by stagecoach ended up being a journey on foot. Was no anyway, answer. Mary Brock walked all the way to meet her brother. Um, and when she got to Joseph, she um, ended up meeting a man who had a land claim right next to Joseph's. It was just to the north of Joseph's land claim. And it was the one that's outlined in red here, belonged to a man named William Moody, who was a friend of, of Joseph. So she met William and then ended up marrying him um, in 1863. Um, and they ended up going back to St. Mary's, um, that part of Ontario, but it was St. Mary's specifically. I guess they didn't think they could um, make a living um, running a store in what had just become Great Ravenhurst in 1862. So they decided to go to St. Mary's and run a store there. Um, it said that Timothy Eaton worked for them briefly in that store. <laughs> anyway, for whatever reason, they didn't stay there uh, in St. Mary's. They decided to come back to Gravenhurst. They built what would be a combination home and um, store on Muskoka Road. And it looked like that over to the uh, left there, um, which became ultimately um, almost like an apartment building. They subdivided into a bunch of, of living spaces. They called it Moody Terrace. Um, after her husband died, um, she sold 
um, that property and that to uh, the man named Martin, who would eventually tear it down. Actually, not too eventually, he did it pretty much right away. And he tore it down and instead built in his place a really what they call a luxury tourist home at the time, Martin Manor. Moody name, by the way, um, is still, I think, remembered by some as on the bay at Gull Lake, um, right at the very end, um, in the north end of Gull Lake, uh, as Moody Bay. Some people know it as Lily Bay, but um, it, it was Moody's Bay. Um, but there's also a little wee tiny street um, that runs into uh, Gull Lake. I think it's about a block long, and it's uh, called Moody's. I could get into a sort of a disagreement or a discussion with some of you, I'm sure, on this one. The headline in a 1929 newspaper um, article was, first school teacher was Miss Kyler, um, and her first name was Harriet. Harriet was born in 1852, um, and actually her father uh, was a millwright, Stephen Kyler. Uh, the first school in Gravenhurst was built around 1863-64. Again, that's not a picture of it, but it's a picture of one like it. Uh, and it was built by five of the people who had been early settlers in the village. Uh, as soon as that school was built uh, and built by hand, I might say, they actually cut the trees, hewed the wood, um, made the logs, put the chipping in between and all that sort of thing. And Joseph Brock was one, Henry Brines was another. Um, a man named James Sharp was another. Um, they all worked together to get, well, five of them, James McCabe, another, to get that schoolhouse built. And it's assumed that they believed that Harriet Kyler taught there in that 1860 period. That school was replaced in 1874 and then burned down in 1876 and was replaced again in 1877. It's sort of what went on. But Harriet Kyler would have been making somewhere in the neighborhood of $142 a year. And she would have been paying her board out of that because of course she wasn't, her father didn't live right in town. So uh, um, you can imagine that there wasn't a whole lot left over uh, from that. I'm gonna go with her being the first teacher. All along, we've been talking about people who are um, pioneers, if you like, in the in the time, people coming into a, a, what is really a wilderness. Lizzie Yarnett didn't really come into a wilderness, but she did come into a town um, that was just kind of getting its legs under it. Uh, Lizzie Yarnett was born in Luther Township. Um, if you know where the Luther Marsh is, um, that's sort of where she was. Her family, Arnett Farm, was, was on uh, what is now Highway 89. Um, she came here all by herself. She was 28 years old, and she came to Gravenhurst in 1884. And she stayed her very first night in the Royal Hotel or Cooper's Hotel. Don't know what she would have made of all the stuffed animals, the bear in the backyard that you could wrestle if you wanted to especially after you'd had a few brew at the, at the bar. Um, but whatever she made of it, she decided to stay. And interestingly enough, I think at the very beginning when she came, she was working for a man named McKim, who, William McKim, who had a store right at the corner of um, um, Muskoka Road and Brock. And so if you think about where the Albion Hotel is and then go across the street, but on the same side, um, where the toy store is now, that was actually where McKim's store was. And uh, she worked in there as a milliner and somebody who could actually make dresses and so on. Uh, she was very, very good with a needle, apparently. Anyway, she worked there until 1887 when the Great Fire happened and burned down not only McKim's store, but everybody else's store on the main street, both sides. I don't really know what she did from there. I have nothing that says. And then she, what? But for whatever reason and for, uh, however she managed to do it, whether she continued to do dressmaking and, and millinery work without a store initially, she eventually opened 
what we now know as the one side of Pizza Pizza. Um, it's the corner of Muskoka Road at Royal. And I've drawn that red arrow to show you it. Um, that was her millinery shop right on that corner. If you went back along the sidewalk on the side of that building, um, and if you went up the staircase to the second story, her nephew, uh, Robert, sorry, not Robert, but Alfred Das, um, opened a newspaper called the Gravenhurst Banner in that particular location. Uh, he was her nephew. Um, she, in fact, had a wife who's in nieces living with her at various times because she never married. And I suspect that they were all looking for a place to come and sort of get a start. Anyway, the picture that I have of her, I have several others, but they're, um, she's got great big hats on and you cannot see her face. You can't get any sense of, of what she looks like at all. So that's the best I could do. And that's Elizabeth, elderly Elizabeth or Lizzie Arnett and her niece, Ida Das, who lived with her. And as I say, so did um, Alfred Das, the editor and owner of the Gravenhurst Banner, um, and his brother, Robert, and another nephew, Howard, for a while. And they all lived in that house, which is the one on the right there, Miss Arnott's house, which is now housed directly. Um, Linder's hairdressing. This was the nicest advertisement I could find that was put in the paper for Lizzie. A lot of them said things like slaughter prices, <laughs> which I guess meant, um, you know, she was, oh, just reducing everything to the absolute bottom. But I hated that word slaughter in the, in the advertisement. So I picked one that didn't have that. But she was very clear to say that it was cash millinery store. Don't you start thinking about credit. Not going to happen. There are a couple of really funny stories in the old newspapers about Lizzie Arnott. I think she was quite gregarious. Um, she never married, but there are uh, stories of her being out in a canoe with Mr. Homer, who actually owned at one point the, um, what we call a big jet store. Mr. Homer capsized uh, in Bell Lake in the canoe. And I can only imagine her with that hat on. And it's a wonder she didn't drown. Um, all the clothing and the hats were enormous. Anyway, um, she didn't. Uh, but there are several stories like that, which are quite fun to read. She's actually a forebear of, of um, someone I grew up with, who was at one time my very best company is related to these people. Is an interesting woman. I think she led what must have been a rather sad life. Uh, in the very beginning, Dougal Brown had opened a hotel called the Steamboat and Stage, which was roughly located where the, the post office is. Um, he wasn't really into having hotels. That really wasn't what he wanted to do. So he, in fact, sold it uh, about 878 or so. And he went into um, land speculation, you might call it. He at one point had 92 lots in the town of Gravenhurst um, that he owned and he was selling off at, um, you know, not bargain prices. Um, and in fact, uh, when you drive along that one side of town, you'll see his first wife's name is Sarah. His second wife's name is Louisa. And so you've got the names for the streets. You've got Brown Street, you know, so uh, he owned property all through there. Sarah, um, well, he and, and Sarah had, had four children, um, the oldest being John Duncan or JD, as he was eventually always known. Um, and Jenny F. went off to the United States. F. E. Um, uh, Dougal was supposed to go to Panama to work on the Pan Panama Canal for some reason. Heaven only knows why anyone would decide to do that. But he disappeared and was never heard from again. Anyway, all very well and fine, but Sarah, Dougal's wife, died. Um, and as a result, um, there is uh, Dougal Brown, and he's been left with four children. So what's the first thing a man is going to do in that situation? He's going to find a wife. 
And the wife he found was Louisa King, daughter of George King, who was a butcher in the town. George actually had uh, four daughters and uh, all of them actually have a sort of an interesting tale to tell. But Louisa is the person who took on um, the raising of four children. She also um, had a little boy of her own uh, with Dougald who died about six weeks after he was born. And so she never did have another child that was her own. Dougald Brown himself died very, very shortly after this. And so here's Louisa who has gotten married, um, you know, <laughs> in a matter of no time at all. And he's, he's unwell, you can tell kind of even looking at the picture. He, he's supposed to, supposedly 14 years older than his wife in that picture, but he looks like he could be her father. And in actual fact, it's not long before he's dead. And she's left with four children to raise. Brown's Beverages plant, which he had already started to run, and four lodgers living in her house. So this is a woman with some courage. The picture at the bottom, I think, tells a story that perhaps moves just to mention. That's Louisa leaning on the um, memorial um, to uh, Duo Brown. And it still is there in the Lakeview Cemetery, very close to the, uh, the main driveway into Lakeview. Um, she's leaning on there. Her son, JD, is the man who's standing beside the buggy back there, only really is not all that much a man. He's 16. And her daughters, Jenny and Effie, are, are in the buggy. And her little boy is up at the front there with the horses. And uh, she must have Leaning on that monument, I can only imagine her thinking to herself, what have I done? What have I done? Anyway, she would go on to live for 64 years after her husband. And that's one heck of a long time to be widowed. I think she was probably a very brave and a very canny Scot and knew what she was about. And she and her son, J.D., quickly formed a partnership to run the beverage company, Brown's Beverages, and eventually she turned it over to him. Funny to think of her living to 1949. You know, I mean, it's just hard to imagine that she was part of, you know, for some of us anyway, part of our world. I just am mentioning Louisa King came from a family of four girls that were all King's sisters. I'll just mention Sarah King, Taverly, married a man named Taverly and went to the West. So we don't really know a lot about her after that. Emma King married a man named Port. Her son, Herb Port, was a pharmacist in Gravenhurst. And he, and that's actually the house where, where Emma and Herb lived. Um, <laughs> Emma lived with Herb and had basically provided him with a um, home on the provider that he would not marry until she was dead. That's an awful thing to do to somebody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but maybe it wouldn't have been very easy to live with her anyway as a mother-in-law. I don't know. But um, anyway, so that story will come back to haunt us in a few moments. Julia King McKean uh, is the grandmother of Frank Miller. So these girls, um, you know, married into uh, some prominent relationships, even though Louise's didn't last for very long. Funny how Mr. Port, Emma's husband, you, you don't actually read anything about him. I, I don't know whether he was just sort of <laughs> it's her son that we end up knowing more about. We're moving a little bit farther into the future in a way, but not totally. Emma Rome Mickle is somebody who fascinates me. Um, there are people who would say, why would she be in here? Because she obviously lived a pretty um, well-to-do life and you know what did she what did she contribute to the history of Gravenhurst well she was born in Paisley at a time when Charles Mickle was working very near to Paisley in a place called Chesley and he was at that time a lumber dealer a lumber merchant what she didn't know was that he was actually um, ready to be if not already uh, was a lumber man himself he had all kinds of logging teams that were out um, in the bush in the wintertime, and he had mills galore. He had a lumber mill, a planing mill, a shingle mill, and he had duplicates of all of those down in Severn Bridge. 
I don't know what she would have thought. That house that she began her life with Charles in is a house that was right up above the, uh, all the mills in, in uh, what became Mickletown or West Cravenhurst. Apparently the noise from the saws in those mills, and remember that there were as many as 17 lumber mills going at one time in that bay. Apparently the noise was absolutely deafening from those saws that you could hardly um, stand to be outside um, until you got used to it, I suppose, um, listening to the, the sound of the saws. So I don't know what Emma, who came from a very small quiet town, a little farming town called Paisley, I don't know what she would have thought living right up above all those mills. But one of the things that happens with houses that are um, pretty close to lumber mills is that sparks tend to fly. And whether that's exactly what happened or not, I don't know. Remember, we're all carrying lanterns at this point. We've got open fires and whatnot. But the house caught fire, and she managed to rescue her little son, Charles um, Jr., Charles Samuel, from the burning house. And the house burned to the ground. I don't know what Emma said to him, but Charles apparently said, <laughs> okay, um, we won't live down here anymore. <laughs> I'll build you a new house up on Bay Street. And that's in fact the house that he did build. I know the one picture is rather scruffy looking, um, but it was the best one I could find that didn't have a whole group of people standing in front of it. It also has that very iconic um, flower pot arrangement. Um, there is one still on the lawn there. At least I hope it's still there. It was there until recently anyway, let's say. And uh, uh, that was the, the Mickle house. This is a wedding down there. And I think that's Howard Kane and the daughter Bertha who were uh, married in that picture. Yeah, I'm sure. They had, as, as it turned out, they had three children. They had two daughters and a, and a son, Charles. Beautiful home. The reason I've included her is not simply that she rescued her son from a burning building or that she had to deal with a massive home built on a massive three lot piece of land. But she also, I think, contributed so much to Gravenhurst's life. Um, she was somebody who really, really loved plays, dramas. She loved entertainment, musical entertainment and so on. And she was known to have these things sort of on her lawn at the drop of a hat, the three arches that are on the third um, lot that forms that Mickle plot, those three arches formed arches that were useful for entrances and exits for doing a play and so on. Um, and she would have strawberry socials and invite the entire town to come. Um, and granted, she has money to, but I don't think she ever really forgot that there were people living in that West Gravenhurst area and indeed in other parts of Gravenhurst who did not have what she had. So two things as a result, I suspected that Charles Mickle's Folly as he as it was always called the Opera House, which he built in 1901 as mayor, he was the one that committed the funds to do it. I suspect it was much more likely to be Emma's Folly because I think she's the one that was behind him. And I think he loved her so dearly that if she had said, you know, I think we really need a place where we can stage plays, by golly, I think he would have done it. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> she also had a boat. This is the best boat picture of it, but um, she had a boat called uh, the Birth of May. Sometimes it was used to tow logs uh, in the bay. So it wasn't always um, a lovely little launch. It was sometimes a very hardworking boat, but she would take, gather up a whole group of women issue them an invitation and say, um, I'm going to take you all out on the lake and we'll go to in those days, the islands were all owned. Uh, I'm going to take you to an island. We're going to go for a picnic. I'll bring all the food and all you need to do is get in. And you can see that there are a number of women in that boat towards the back and the women at the front who don't look as though they are as well to do as an Emma Meckel might have been. I think that Emma Meckel is the one with the hat sitting by herself, sort of centered there. But I may be wrong about that. It doesn't look like quite as grand a hat as perhaps she would have had. There's another picture of the birth of May, and it's filled with people. 
that she has invited to go for a boat ride. Some of them look quite well dressed. Some of them look as though, you know, they're not well to do. In fact, this is something that she did on a regular basis. So I think as a woman who remembered that there were people less fortunate than she, um, Emma Mick was a good role model. Sorry about the voice. Bringing you into our century a little more um, directly, I don't know how many of you here um, will remember Clara Broughton, but there'll be a few of you who do, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And if you lived here at the time when she was alive, of course you would remember her because she was so prominent and she was so involved in everything and she was, uh, she was just that kind of a person. She and her mother and her sister, she was six years, um, Clara May, her mother Marianne and her brother Maitland uh, came to Gravenhurst in order to get treatment for Maitland. Um, in actual fact, I think that Clara had had kind of a rough life. She lost her father when she was quite young. Then she lost her little brother uh, a couple of years later. And then she discovers that Maitland has tuberculosis. And so they come to Gravenhurst to live seeking treatment for Maitland at the Cottage Sanatorium. They came roughly 1902, 1903. She began teaching at Gravenhurst High School in 1904. Maitland didn't live very much longer after they got here. Um, they got here, as I say, roughly 1903. By 1906, he had died. He was only 20 years old. He was just a young lad. The three women seemed to have enough money that they could purchase a home on Philip Street East, the street I live on. And it's the home where Hillary Cole lives now. Or at least almost now, anyway. <laughs> And uh, the three women lived there. They ran it as a home during the winter time and Clara taught at the high school. In the summertime, they ran it as a boarding house for tourists and they had all kinds of people who would um, you know, uh, book in to stay for a week or two weeks or several weeks or whatever. And to the point where she ended up with this very large um, sort of pseudo family of people who saw her as someone that really belonged to them. And uh, they saw her as somebody who was a part of their lives. Um, that's her um, principal, um, that's Elsie Tapp, um, that's Shirley Barlow's dad, um, standing behind uh, the principal of the high school at the time when Clara was working there. She didn't last super, super long. She, taught until about 1943, and then she had to quit with ill health. Well, here's one of the dinners that you, you might have expected to find her at up there in the upper right. Um, you know, people who would just drop in suddenly uh, saying, oh, I haven't seen you in ages, Clara. Um, you know, here we are, we're just up from Toronto for the day. And lo and behold, they'd be at dinner. <laughs> As well, that's Clara on the on the left hand side. Clara and her sister, older. Although I'm not sure you can tell that from that picture, um, May, to my mind, does not look to be six years older than her, her sister Clara, but she is. Um, in that bottom picture, is uh, laying the cornerstone uh, for the what I think they called it the education wing of Trinity United Church. So it's the area where they were going to have like the entrance, be able to go down to the Sunday school, all that sort of thing. Um, so she laid that cornerstone. And I'm sure she was at like, uh, asked to do it at least partially because they contributed pretty substantially <laughs> to that. I, I don't know how they had so much money, but they seem to have because they also, Clara and May, uh, purchased the Carillon. And I, I'm sure many of you remember the Carillon. Certainly I remember it from when I came here um, and listening to that, um, you know, they played on sort of bells, if you like, from the Tower of the uh, United Church. Um, it was lovely to listen to. I always liked it. Well, they donated that to the church as well. When she was turning 90, uh, she, everybody in the town basically was, you know, invited to come. And this included a whole lot of people who had been tourists at her home, invited to come to her home. 
the food was all supplied by the women of the uh, United Church and uh, no gifts were you know, required. She died the following year. Not many of you perhaps will be as familiar with this woman, Mary McBride. She actually didn't own property given hers, which is always interesting. So many of these women in an area, they didn't because they, I mean, they're making things. So she's getting paid $16 a month and she's paying out of the 16.6 for her board. So she's got 10 bucks a month for, you know, um, not going to buy you too much <laughs> at, even at this time. But Mary McBride um, began teaching briefly in Brunel Township, which is up in the Huntsville area. And then, in fact, she taught for a few years out at Parkway before she moved into Gravenhurst Central School. Um, she was only there for a couple of years. And I often muse about why she uh, wanted to make the move. And it was her choice to do so from Gravenhurst Central School, which would have been the larger town school to the North Ward School, which was the school up on what's now, um, oh dear me, uh, Winewood Street, thank you very much, voice in the, <laughs> voice in the back on Winewood. And um, I, I think I have some ideas about why she would have wanted to do that. I suspect the children were probably better behaved up there. Um, she taught grades one to three and she taught for 50 years. Now, if that's not a testimony to endurance, I don't know what it is, my goodness. I can't even imagine what would be left of her by the time she was done with that. But a comment that was made about her was the warmth of her personality, her breadth of vision, and the depth of her devotion marked her as a special woman. She retired in 1947 and she died in the early 1960s. But in fact, a huge role model for all kinds of young people in this town who had her as a teacher. Lots of you will remember Dorothy Shaw. <laughs> when I first came to teach at Gravenhurst High School in 1973, there was a statue by Hillary Clark Cole in the, um, you know, right across from the office, standing right there in the middle of the hall. And it was called Our Miss Thompson. Well, I loved it, absolutely loved it. And I always thought for some reason, maybe I didn't read the label or whatever, I thought it was Dorothy Shaw. <laughs> I thought, oh, and then I found out later on, no, she, I don't think Miss Thompson is really anybody. Uh, she's a, a figment of Hillary's imagination. Dorothy Shaw um, came from the sort of Lanark Carlton Place area of, of Ontario. And she came here to teach in 1926. Um, I think she was quite content in teaching Latin and humanities at the high school. She was teaching for L.C. Tapp, who apparently, for all reports, was a wonderful principal. But he came home for lunch on uh, Good Friday, or the day before Good Friday in 1940, and he dropped dead. Young man, really not old at all. And one minute she has a principal, the next minute she is the principal. And I don't know what that would have been like to be thrust into that kind of responsibility, but I think if anybody could handle it, it would be, it would be Dorothy Shaw. She was amazing. Uh, she had all kinds of, of uh, energy. She was a very avid curler um, and, and you know, was really involved in that. Um, she did all kinds of other things as well. But one of the things that she did, I think, was um, to guide the idea of a new school, a new high school in 1951, and then to have a new addition put on it in 1959. Um, you have to have somebody with vision who talks to the builder and says, no, 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 no. That's not where that's going to go. It's going to go over here. No, no, we don't want one of those. We want two of those and so on. So in fact, um, she, uh, I, the superintendent, shall we say, the building of when she retired from teaching, um, she became the chair. In those days, boards of education were um, 
uh, convened in a town and they were looking after all the schools of that town, elementary, secondary, and so on. In fact, at one point, you actually had a board for elementary and a board for secondary. Then they combined them and it was Cravenhurst Board of Education. And she was the chair. And she was the only woman, of course, on that Board of Education. Um, women normally were never elected. In fact, I don't think they even ran for office um, in anything like a Board of Education or a town council or whatever. She was also a co-chair of the hospital. It was Dorothy Shaw who was intended to marry her in port. You remember Herb and his mother? Well, mommy had said he couldn't marry until, <laughs> until she was dead. I don't know, what does that do to your prayers at night? <laughs> does there come a point when you start to pray for something and think, oh my goodness, I can't pray for that. Anyway, um, yes, she did die. And um, Herb and Dorothy planned and built, were building a home on Bay Street um, in which they would live and they were planning to be married fairly soon when he dropped dead of a heart attack. So can you imagine? I mean, anyway, she moved into that house. Um, it's the house that is actually a new looking house, red brick, on Bay Street, on the north side of Bay Street, um, the corner of Sarah and I think it would be. And um, yeah, she moved into that house with a, another teacher. Who lived there. is somebody whom I admire greatly, and that is Katie Manson. Katie Manson uh, was born as Katie Banting, and she was related to Dr. Banting of the Banting and Best group at um, Alliston. Yeah, she was part of that family. She came to Severn Bridge to take up teaching in a one-room school at Severn Bridge. But it was the central school in Severn Bridge, so it wasn't like totally a country school. It was in the town. And she came there to teach school. Uh, and she taught basically at Severn Bridge, you could say continuously from 1938 to 1979. So again, those people who, boy, had tenacity, grit, and <laughs> more patience than I ever had, that's for sure. Anyway, um, she became the principal at Morrison Central Public School, which was the new school that replaced the one room Severn Bridge School. Um, for the last 20 years of her career there. Um, on the day of her celebration of her retirement, unveiled the fact that they were naming the school after her. And I think to myself, now there is a retirement gift, right? Mm -hmm. That's a beauty, that's a beauty. And I think, well, very few pictures of her. For some reason, when you look at the pictures from the schools where she taught, She's not in them. I think she's one of those people who said, well, we'll just get the kids to the picture, you know, but this is her retirement night and unveiling her gift. Lots of people know who Wanda Miller is. You read a list of what she was involved in and what she was doing, and you can hardly even imagine how she would keep going from day to day. I, one thing I hadn't known was that at one point she was the manager of Muskoka Sands Inn. Uh, she was the president of the Central Ontario Liberal Association, but all these other things. And so often president of the children, say president of the Women's Association of Business Women. Um, she presented a talent show through the Lions Club uh, every year. Um, and she supervised it, she directed it, she got the costumes together, she got the people together. I don't know where she had that kind of time and how she could do it. Um, she was a member of the Town Recreation Commission, and when she ran for mayor, she was elected. And she was elected uh, for six years in a row, 1954 to 60. You didn't have an election every four years, you had one pretty much every year um, in those days. President of the Board of Trade, she, she founded the Home and School Association at Gravenhurst High School and for many years was a columnist in the Gravenhurst newspaper. Um, and the column she wrote was Know Your Neighbor. And there are lots of really good ones. I mean, we've got a number of them in the archives, obviously. 
um, which actually just do a whole little pen portrait of uh, people in the town, not necessarily the movers and shakers, but people who um, she felt everybody ought to know about. She also did broadcasting for CFOR. And one of the people in CFOR um, who commented on her said they had never met anyone who needed no explanations for um, how to uh, do something on radio, how to be a personality, how to interview all that. She had it cold apparently and knew exactly what to do. I think that if you were talking to her and asking her at the time, what was the highlight of her? Certainly would have said being elected mayor. But I think she would have said as well, being the person who got to welcome the Queen and Prince Philip and to sit with them on a erected lake so that they could A, open the barge, um, which had been newly renovated, but also they could hear um, a very short version of a concert uh, before they were on their merry way again, heading off to, uh, off to, uh, who presented the, Say that little girl. Yep. That, that penny? Yep. Oh, that's, no, that's, um, that's Wanda's daughter. Oh, the little one? I think that's her, yeah. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, no. Cindy. That's, that's uh, Claremont. Um, Cindy Claremont. Cindy, that's Cindy, yeah. Yeah, Cindy Claremont. Yeah. She's gone. Yeah. Her, her, her daughter actually presented something to the Queen as well, but that's Cindy Claremont. My sister Penny going up to the even presenting the flowers, and I was so indignant. <laughs> Why do you Darn know? that penny. <laughs> How dare she? Somebody said they had snapped a picture of Prince Philip, but I've never seen it. Look at the legs of somebody <laughs> walking by. Wouldn't that have been fun to see that one? <laughs> I touched him. Ooh, and you've I never washed out. you've never washed your hands since, have you? No, no, I can imagine. Yep. Wasn't your badminton hand, obviously. Yeah, it was my badminton. Oh, it was. <laughs> That's what gave me the strength. Right. Breaking into some of the um, people who were very fine artists that we've had in our town. Marie Aiken Barnes, Marie Aiken, Marie Miller, as she was, was born in Alberta. Her parents were Scandinavian, but she was actually born in, Al in Alberta. Um, they recognized that she had something and they recommended that she go to the Vancouver School of Art, which became the Emily Carr University of Art and Design. She came to Ontario in 1960, so she wasn't young when she came here, but she was heavily involved in the Ontario Craft Foundation and the World Craft Foundation. And one of the things that she had as a specialty was this business of using lichens to create dye. Um, I bet you there aren't too many people at this time, women particularly, who are going out pulling lichens off of various <laughs> sundry trees and in the bush and so on, and then grinding them up or doing whatever to see what kind of a dye they would give. But in fact, she did. And uh, I think her, her hangings are absolutely beautiful. She was commissioned to do two of them in the Cravener's uh, United Church. Are they both still there? Okay, so the one from the balcony, which went along the balcony this way, and then the docile curtains that hung at the, at the altar. She also was commissioned by the city of Barrie um, for their courthouse to do a wall hanging of that type. Um, everybody remembers the, um, <laughs> the uh, what should we call it, the studio that she built um, in that... Um, uh, <laughs> And that horrific little yeah tower down there. I mean, every time I think of it, I never know what to call the thing because my goodness, um, it was a pretty ugly looking building. If anybody could transform it into something useful, it would be her. And I think for a while it was looking not too bad. Um, she had people who wanted to live there and work with her and so on. Uh, she was certainly somebody who had all kinds of, of uh, uh, talent to give and worked in the design department of Georgian College. She did a number of things with her life. Um, she eventually, um, after leaving and um, divorcing Gord Aiken, who was the member of parliament at the time here, 
um, she eventually went on with her life and um, through macular degeneration began to lose her sight. And uh, she married a man who was actually a, a specialist in that, his name was Barnes. Um, and uh, she married this man who was a specialist in, in dealing with macular degeneration, but she did become blind um, before the end of her life. So an awful thing to happen to a visual artist. Not, not fair. I was, it was a toss up. I, it was a toss up. I decided, I had to decide between May Linzel and Dot Duncan. And the only reason I picked May really was I know more about her and there's more in the archives about her than there is about Dot. We have Dot's columns, but Dot's columns weren't about Dot, they were about other people and events and so on. Um, but because of Archdeacon Linzel and so on, there's a, a fair bit of information about May and I certainly knew May personally. Um, she had a not very happy life, I think in many ways in the beginning. Um, her mother uh, died very, very when she was very, very young, and she was um, sent to live with her um, grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Brown, who lived in the house directly across from my house. And um, they were her grandparents, and she was there for the first three years of her life because Archdeacon Linzel um, couldn't raise a little girl all on his own. Um, he eventually um, became the... Um, the chaplain at uh, the cottage sanatorium. And while he was there, he met uh, the head of nursing at the cottage sanatorium, a woman named Edith Garnett, and he married her in 1922. Um, May uh, was able to come back and live at home then with them. They didn't immediately live in the house that we would think of as Linzel House now, but not very long after that they did. Um, May grew up in Gravenhurst. She attended elementary and secondary school in Gravenhurst. She was self-described as being um, a bit of a dreamer. So she would arrive at school late most days. And um, I think there were a number of times when the teacher had to say to her, May, are you paying attention? Because she was you know, off in another land. When she graduated from high school, she attended Shaw Business College in Toronto. Actually, she started out at the University of Guelph um, studying home economics. She thought she was going to learn how to cook. <laughs> and she wrote a, a letter back saying, in it, you know, all they teach here is science and chemistry. What the heck am I doing here? <laughs> this isn't anything I want to know about. And so she left pretty abruptly. But Shaw Business College was more suited to her. And she eventually ended up working um, in Toronto for a couple of different companies. As well. While she was in Toronto, she got quite involved in the Anglican Church there and was part of their, um, you know, their quote unquote young peoples, which wasn't meant for little kids. It was meant for, for young, young people. <laughs> and uh, when she came back, she came back because her, I guess we'll call her her stepmother, Edith Garnett, had died really suddenly in 1945. And there's Archdeacon Linzel back on his own again. And so um, she came back to live with him, look after him, keep house for him. They shared a tremendous love of life, the two of them, she and her father. Um, they were both really interested in drama and in acting. And she um, did a number of, of plays in the 1950s as an actor and in Gravenhurst. They were very, very keen on hockey. She described hockey as being swift, scintillating, and clever. And that's not a bad description, I think. The girl um, certainly reflected the things that were her passions. While she worked out at the uh, sanatorium for Dr. Ross as, as his secretary, at the same time, she was, as I say, acting and so on. But she was getting to know a lot of actors coming in for summer theater, straw hat players, and so on. And many of them stayed with her at the borough. Um, eventually, um, hockey players came to stay at the borough. And actually, interestingly enough, one of the teachers that we've already talked about, Ms. Shaw, um, stayed at the borough when she first came here to teach. The borough was the name she gave this house. It doesn't look like a borough to me. It's pretty big, 
But in actual fact, I think it had all the comfort of feeling like her home, a home she would never have to leave. We constantly read these poems, <laughs> which wrote in the Sand Sun Virtual Event in the Graveners News, about Lenny and Steve. You remember Lenny and Steve? Two junior C hockey players, you'll remember them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and one of the other's trays, that's right. Anyway, um, we were constantly hearing about their, anic uh, their um, um, antics, but also their um, things that they got into when they weren't supposed to. And uh, she loved cooking for them, absolutely loved cooking for them. And most people would say, providing you didn't go in the kitchen, um, that she was a really good cook. And that, you know, her, her, her meals were wonderful. It's just that if you went in the kitchen, as I did a few times to pick up cookies for Sunday school, um, I'd be thinking, <laughs> am, I, am, I, hmm, am I giving these out to the kids? Two of whom are mine. <laughs> but in fact, of course we did because her stuff was pretty darn good. She was a pretty good cook. That's the way we remember me in the final years of her life, I think. Um, she was made citizen of the year in, I've said 1888. Well, no, it was 1988. But um, for her tireless promotion of the town of Gravenhurst, and I think that that was uh, pretty much bang on. Her columns were constantly filled with stories of parties. <laughs> and some of the stories didn't get into her columns, but we certainly heard them from other people of people who are around the theater, people in Gravenhurst. Um, and we always heard about the feasts that she was cooking up for people as well. I think a number of people enjoyed eating at May's. Another time, maybe I'll do, uh, I'll do Dr. Duncan. <laughs> I threw the, the five Hustlestrom girls in, um, another group of girls from my street. Um, only to say that two of them um, joined up in the Second World War uh, with the RCAF. And that was uh, Thelma, Florence Thelma, but she was known as Thelma. And Ragna, um, who at one point didn't live here, was living out in BC, but then eventually came back here to live in the family home. Um, all of the girls, uh, um, I think, were um, exemplary citizens in the town. And uh, the very fact that Ragna Day spent her time teaching pilots and other people how to pack parachutes um, for the planes uh, during the war would tell you that she was a pretty trusted person in the RCAF. You don't mispack, mispack a parachute and um, have anyone live to tell the story. I could never leave Marion Fry out from anything. Marion Fry, <laughs> Cyril in 1948 after the war in Toronto, but they didn't meet there. They met sort of up in the Baysville kind of area. Um, and uh, um, they both were hikers and both loved doing so. She came from Kitchener, he came from Brantford. So, uh, they met up there, they married, uh, their honeymoon was biking across Europe. And that would be just typical of what Mary and Cyril would do. They raised their three children. They built their Scandinavian style home themselves with a little help from their friends, uh, friends at Rubber Set that Cyril was working with. There's a funny story that they both loved to tell and they would take turns telling pieces of the story, whoever got to the piece first, um, often it would be Cyril, but if you listen nice and quietly, you, you get Marion's version over here. They were working on the roof of the house and Cyril had left a hole. I think it was not for a vent, but for a chimney. Anyway, you know what's going to come. I know you do. Um, he warned her half a dozen times or more, do not pack up, Marion. Do not pack up. Do not back up while you're laying those shingles. Don't back up while you reach for those shingles because you'll fall in the hole and you'll go right through. 
Anyway, Cyril brought a tool over to Mary and he walked straight over to her and went straight in the hole and went, went down to the bottom. <laughs> As he said, only his ego was bruised, <laughs> I wonder. But anyway, Marion uh, was that kind of person who would be on the roof doing shingling with Cyril. In her beginning of life in Gravenhurst, she came here in 1951 on a bus and she was sitting with another person that she didn't know um, heading for Gravenhurst and she was coming to meet Cyril who had gotten a job as a chemical engineer at Rubber Set. So she was sitting talking to the passenger beside her and they were talking about, well, what do you do? What do you do? Blah, 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 blah. blah. Little did she know that there was a man sitting in front of her who was listening to their entire conversation, as people do. Anyway, she got off the bus and she was almost tackled from behind by the man who had been sitting listening because his name was Bob Moth. He worked at the uh, um, Cottage Sanatorium and he was rather hoping uh, that he could persuade her, her with her university degree in occupational therapy, to come and work there. So he offered her a job like 30 seconds after she was off the bus. <laughs> and uh, in fact, she said yes. Um, people would say that they were so lucky, but in fact, I think that Cyril and Marion made their own luck. They did things um, the way they wanted to. They did things um, uh, out of, of a belief system. Uh, it had nothing to do with religion, but had everything to do with a reverence for nature, for history, and so on. She very quickly after her work life um, became chairman of, or chairperson, sorry, of the Seguin Museum Board and was often to be found working with uh, Alan Salter um, doing the uh, displays and so on when the Seguin was a museum. She was a working member, not just a member, but a working member of Muskoka Arts Foundation and Muskoka Concert Association. That means anywhere you looked for an advertisement, it would say, call Marion Fry for tickets. Call Mary and Fry for tickets. I mean, I thought to myself, the phone must have been just ringing off the hook. She was also one of those people who, with Mary Stewart, um, would do things like plant flowers to um, enhance the look of the Opera House and, and the Heritage Square and so on. And she didn't have to be a member of the, uh, of the Horticultural Society to do it. It was just something that she did. In 1978, right after the 1977 centennial of Gravenhurst of the village, Mary and Cyril took a look at each other and took a look at the pile of stuff that they had acquired over that centennial year. People had sent in all kinds of photographs and stories and oh, albums and you name it. And it said, this should be in Gravenhurst. This really doesn't need to be in my house. And so in fact, they said to themselves, uh, January the 1st, basically, of 1978, the day after that centennial year ended, they said, I think we need an archive in Gravenhurst. And so they did. Um, they unfortunately had to put all this stuff for quite a while in boxes under the various beds in which the family slept. I remember Alistair telling me at one point when I was teaching him that, uh, well, I don't know if I ever taught Alistair anything, but um, when he was very bright, um, but when I was teaching him, he told me that he did spend his night sleeping with history. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Marion um, had so many interests, you know, the field naturalists, all of that sort of thing. Um, but the history was really something that she was so good at. And although everybody thought it was Cyril, really, who was running Gravenhurst Archives, not on your Nelly. It was Marion who was running it, but Cyril was doing the typing. <laughs> so she would hand him a list of things to be typed and he would type them the cards. It was a, a card based system in those days. And uh, she also had him when cutting the grass. I remember Cyril telling me this and I laughed and laughed because apparently she would go and she would check the grass and just see whether or not he'd you know, gotten all the, all the patches. And eventually she wanted him to cut the grass twice in two directions, you know, go this way and then go that way. <laughs> I loved it. I thought that's just perfect. <laughs> they did all kinds of one 
wonderful things. They traveled all over the world. I mean, their honeymoon was hiking in Europe. So for heaven's sakes, you can only imagine. Three weeks hiking in East Africa, a six month exchange to uh, Beijing, where both Marion and Cyril Carnegie were in an agricultural college there. Uh, she was a contributing writer to Muskoka today, and obviously to Gravenhurst News that Cyril partially owned. Um, but she wrote a number of articles for both the news and Muskoka today about figures and history in, in the town. In the archives, we have, I couldn't tell you how many, countless sheets of paper of her handwritten notes about things. And her handwriting was easy to read. They just all have to be typed. <laughs> I look at them every now and then. I think to myself, oh boy, I don't know. When are we going to get this done? But we will get there eventually someday. When they started the archives, um, they eventually moved into um, a little cupboard um, in the uh, Carnegie Library. And then eventually uh, archives was given a, a room in the new library that was built in 2000. Um, Marion, I went to volunteer with Marion um, in, in 2015 when I retired in 2012. Um, I started to volunteer with her right away. And then in 2015, um, Marion asked me to take the archives over. So that's how I got there. It's all her fault. Um, I had sent a message to Alistair the other day, just asking, you know, what was happening, and I haven't heard back. So I can't really comment any further than that. But these pictures are, are, are fun, I think, in a way. That picture in black and white from the newspaper was taken about three weeks after Ravenhurst Archives was founded. So that's 1978. It's in the end of January, 1978. Um, the woman facing Marion is a shell, and I can't remember her first name, and Bill Snyder, Rubina uh, Curtin, who is Rubina White now, and the other man whose name I don't know. And they're working, of course, in Marion's house <laughs> on Gravenhurst Archive stuff. An archivist doesn't just work with paper. The picture at the bottom is um, Marion and Shirley um, Barlow, and they're out in Barclay uh, looking at um, a building out there and assessing it for what it once was and what it went on to be and so on. In 2017, I was very grateful that we were able to get um, the Ontario Heritage Foundation and the governor, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario to award uh, Cyril and Marion um, a Lifetime Achievement Award for all of the work they had done in Gravenhurst in preserving our history. Not only did they attempt to preserve history through what we have in the archives, but they worked tirelessly on things like the clerk's office, which is of course now a memory only, um, but also the train station and a number of other things that they worked hard on to make sure these, these things were preserved. And I think that they entertained um, the Lieutenant Governor royally on that evening. Um, when we went back to her apartment afterwards, uh, the whole group for, for drinks and so on, um, Cyril and Marion had her in stitches. And I think that Marion was just as funny as Cyril quite often. It's very hard to find pictures of you <laughs> <laughs> playing badminton. They're all in our albums. Of exactly. And I, you know, I. I wondered if I should have come driving and over and find you or go out and find Krista and, and say, Krista, have you got the pictures? Where are they? But these ones I was able to get from um, Chef, the Boston for the Ontario Badminton Association, um, Shutter, Shutter or something like that. Yeah, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so there you are playing badminton down there. And there you are early on um, in your time with Jim and her sisters. And over on the right-hand bottom side, you are both, I think, celebrating a bottle of champagne, the fact that you are officials at the um, Olympics in Barcelona. That, that bottle of champagne was given to us by the- Yeah, by the uh, powers that be, I would imagine. I didn't figure you'd gone out and bought it, you know? <laughs> so we could sit here and drink it while we're waiting for the next match. Um, yeah. Nancy, of course, was born. It feels so funny to talk about you. Um, Nancy, of course, was born and raised here. 
her dad was Cyril Vincent, who had been mayor here, who owned an apart or department store. Um, and um, so Nancy went to um, school here, went to U of T. Um, my husband once told me that she taught um, a bunch of guys that he knew at U of T everything that they needed to know about racket sports. <laughs> and that they had known very little to start. <laughs> so you had your work cut out for you, I think. But there's another side of Nancy besides all the wonderful things that she and Jim accomplished in, in, in the field of sport. Um, and I haven't got my note just handy, or maybe I do have it handy. Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> the things that Nancy was responsible for in the way of sport um, through the Ontario and the National Badminton Association uh, from 1974 to 1980, Nancy was the chairperson in charge of officiating for Badminton Ontario. Her responsibilities as vice president of high performance with Badminton Canada, and that's for a 10 year period, including, included the selection of our national teams for international events, as well as frequently managing these teams. And that must have been a treat um, uh, when they were heading off to world championships and so on. She was also responsible for hiring Canada's first national coach in Badminton and uh, kept our national training center in Calgary running smoothly. There's many more things we could say about that, but what I really wanted to mention as well was the other part of Nancy's life. Um, there were so many parts that this is just one or two of many, but uh, her work as a special education teacher at Gravenhurst High School, working with a discovery program. Um, the kids that Nancy and um, Bill Allmer worked with were not always easy to work with, they had limited experiences and maybe had limited um, um, desire to experience a whole lot of things more. But the trips that uh, they took them on were phenomenal. Canoeing trips, endless canoeing and hiking trips and out into the bush and um, taking kids out there and getting them to test their own metal and, and see what they were made of for themselves. Um, she was a very vital part of our staff at Gravenhurst High School. And we were very, very lucky to have somebody who not only had um, the athletic ability and the athletic skills and the marshalling kind of skills, but also um, <clears throat> just kind of knew how to deal with kids um, who uh, might be somewhat difficult to herd at times. Somebody who has a tremendously special place in the heart is Hillary Clark Cole. Looking at the picture on the left-hand side, <laughs> see the hip? <laughs> I mean, every time I think of, of Hillary's sculptures, so many of them over the many, many years that I've known her and have admired her work, so many of them have had me in fits of laughter to the point of almost, you know, hitting the floor. I can remember the very first time I ever walked into Michael Cole's gallery on Church Street and went downstairs, I think it was, or upstairs, that where Hillary's sculpture was. And I was laughing out loud at, at something I was looking at. And Michael came up the stairs to see what was the matter. He wasn't sure whether I was laughing or what I was doing. But in actual fact, I was laughing. Her sense of metaphor uh, is phenomenal. Um, what she sees in things which are like other things and so on. And how she can take one image and have it become representative of something more. One of the sculptures I particularly love is the one on the top right. I think that is just phenomenal. But look at that, look at that massive oxen beast thing there beside her. Um, Muskox. He's he's a beauty, but her bears, the mother bear and the cubs, the, the um, uh, moose, all of these things have been absolutely phenomenal. Hillary was born in, in, um, in BC um, and came to Ontario um, as a teenager, really. Um, I think her parents knew right off the bat that she had 
what it takes to be an artist. I mean, it just comes out all over the place with Hillary um, and her sense of humor. Anyway, she did go to the College of Art and um, she married Michael and she has gone on to do all kinds of installations that have been wonderful. Um, they've gone into all kinds of industrial settings and, and manufacturing settings. They've gone into all kinds of other places, but maybe one that I don't know, I'm assuming she might be pretty proud of is this. This is an installation that she did on the property of the former Huronia Regional Center. It was done with some of the funds that were dedicated to this, um, funds that were awarded to the, I guess we'll call them survivors, of the Huronia Center abuse. And uh, she was asked to create a memorial sculpture there. The people who died in the Huronia Center, as was true in so many others, um, were buried sort of higgledy-piggledy without a name, without a monument or a marker. They were simply uh, thrust in the ground and forgotten. When Marilyn and Jim Dalmage, and Marilyn Dalmage is somebody else I wanted to talk about, but I just didn't know how there were so many other women I, I've thought of that I thought, oh, I should have, I should have. But um, when Marilyn and Jim began to explore what had gone on at Huronia and, and ultimately at Gravenhurst as well, but particularly at Huronia, um, they came to the conclusion that these had, had to be, they had to find them, uh, who the people were. I've actually had people contact me at the archives and ask me about what might have become of somebody who was, who had died, they thought, in the regional center here, and where on earth were they buried because they weren't where their family was. And I mean, that's one of those things where you just kind of go, oh my God, I, I have no idea what to say to this. Well, what Hillary said to it is this, and I think it's absolutely beautiful. And it does capture that moment that says, we have to, we have to reclaim those names and remember them. And if anything else would make me proud, it would certainly be associated with the person who, who did that. Stephanie Boyd. <laughs> Stephanie Boyd, an amazing army in a hundred different directions. I had all kinds of information to put on this slide. Um, in actual fact, it's somewhere in the atmosphere. <laughs> it's, it's out there wandering around and I normally don't lose documents in that way. But I'll tell you, a frantic search went on today when I was just going through this and went, wait a minute, where's the stuff besides Stephanie's picture? Wait a minute, where's the stuff besides Stephanie's picture? And of course, the stuff isn't there. And on top of that, I couldn't even find where they had disappeared to. But I can tell you a little bit, and then we'll ask her mother as well. But, uh, you know, one of the things I loved reading about Stephanie when I was preparing this talk was the stuff that was said of her in high school. It's all very well to know that she was a member of the U.S. National Women's Hockey Team and, you know, uh, that they won medals and so on. But, you know, you knew what kind of a kid she was right from the start. And when I start reading the 1987 newspaper stories of the basketball team, the soccer team, and so on, and the person who's writing them, who isn't even a member of the staff or whatever, certainly not Stephanie's mother, the person who's writing these stories is from the newspaper, and she's talking about Stephanie Boy and talking about her like as a miracle worker with a basketball or a miracle worker with the with a soccer ball. She would be pers the person who would score more than half the points in a game for a team. Um, that was either in both soccer and in basketball. And it was really, really interesting to read through it because then, of course, when the academic awards came along, there she was again. <laughs> and I think my husband would have always said that in order to be a good athlete, you've got to be smart. And there was no question at all about Stephanie in that department. Stephanie has spent a lot of time giving back. And 
the fact that she has given back so loyally through her hockey school, which she ran for quite a number of years here in Gravenhurst. I think at Huntsville as well. No, no, no just only in Gravenhurst, okay. Um, brought in girls from all over Ontario. And uh, these girls, look at, look at the role model they've got in that top picture there um, with her face peering through between them. Uh, can you imagine being coached by anyone better than that? Not only does she have the creds um, in terms of what she's actually done in her own life as a hockey player, but she also has a sense of never giving up, which it said over and over again in the newspaper clippings about her as a, as a girl in high school, never giving up, driving all the time uh, to score that basket that would tie the game or that would win the game or whatever. Um, and often it was, it was Stephanie who scored all of the points. Um, I didn't teach her. Um, I noticed <laughs> one of the articles was talking about um, Bruce Dart and saying, you know, how proud he was that he had actually made her who she was. <laughs> you know, Bruce, in his sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, no, Bruce. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I think she was born with it and uh, she had it right in spades. And uh, um, she today is vice president yep, of, uh, um, I was going to say Nike, but it isn't Nike, it's Adidas. Yes, Adidas uh, company and travels all over the world. But she gives back in so many ways. And one of the ways was when a hockey team was being formed, girls, women's, whatever you want to call it, hockey team in Gravenhurst, she provided all the practice jerseys. And, you know, that's that little things like that. Well, not such a little thing. Um, for girls who are just trying to get something going in the way of a hockey team um, would mean so, so much. Uh, she's provided all kinds of things to so many girls. Um, in our area, and I think she is truly a homebody in so many ways, because her mom and I had a conversation not too long ago in which she said um, that basically Stephanie, you know, is rooted in Gravenhurst, and, and, you know, that this is where she, where she wants to put things that she can give or do or whatever, um, where she wants to share her abilities and her, her knowledge and so on, and boy, when you've got somebody like that um, who is able and willing to share with the young girls in the town, what a role model we've got right here. Are there any questions? Anybody want to suggest some other names in case I decide to do a, a second one of these? I think there are a bunch of, of names really that, I mean, Dot Duncan was one I mentioned earlier, but uh, I'm sorry? Joanne, yeah. Anybody else? Names? Well, I I was running through, you know, through my own mind, you know, what, what stood out in my mind as 